can you just tell me? Sorry. Okay, and how it goes? Left. Left. Okay. So, and uh, so, the first I would like to convince you that the universe exists. Uh, in the universe, we have the turbulence as well. And everywhere there is a turbulence. So this is a nice picture by Van Gogh. This is a credit to the paper by uh, in, um, in uh, Cosmos and Culture in 2015, how the Van Gogh's turbulent mind captured the basic laws of the turbulence. And it shows the turbulence in each media. It is in air, in the fluid, and everywhere. So, of course, when we speak about the turbulence, the first association, it is about the flying here in Trieste to this conference. And probably if someone took the flight from Munich, knows that there is a usual turbulence and you have to fasten the belts. And uh, when you go more in the space, we know that the cosmic turbulence uh, it is almost everywhere magnetized and plays a very important role when we are describing the physical processes on the sun, in the galaxies, in interstellar, and in the cluster medium. So now I would like to tell you that the turbulence might be presented in the universe and in fact in the very early uh, stages. So here it is a brief history of our universe. So. Uh, Usually everyone will be convinced that here we have uh, in this reionization epoch and galaxy formation, of course, everyone is convinced that there is a turbulence, but I will uh, talk about the turbulence which exists much earlier here before the, any kind of, even uh, during the cosmological phase transition, when there was no any regular matter. So the outline of the, my talk, based on this one, will be following. I will uh, talk about the origin of the magnetohydrodynamical turbulence, and I will review the primordial magnetic fields and also the cosmological velocity fields. I will talk uh, about the evolution of the turbulence, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence, and um, I will describe the amplification and the decay. I will also talk uh, about scaling laws. Uh, and these simulations that we have done are three-dimensional, compressible. And I will talk about very briefly about the signatures. So uh, about the cosmic magnetic fields and primordial magnetic fields, the first idea comes by Enrico Fermi in 49 in the Fizzer of Letters papers in which he, he tried to explain the origin of the cosmic radiation. So, uh, but today there are some precise measurements that can indicate that uh, magnetic fields exist not only in sun, in the galaxies uh, and clusters, but most probably the magnetic fields exist in the voids where we do not have matter. So here it is a big question from where these magnetic fields can come. So this is a paper by Neronov and Walk published in Science in 2010 and they have used the Fermi observation of the blazer spectra and uh, based on this observation uh, in fact that they do not observe TV range and GV range of the blazer spectra that it is expected to be seen. Uh, they concluded that probably uh, when the blazer ultra high energy photons are propagating, they are going to the long, uh, large scale correlated magnetic field uh, and the producing of the cascade between the electron and protons is interrupted because uh, uh, positrons and electrons are diluted in the different way of the sign difference, electric charge difference. So here, this dashed re region here 
it is a lower bound. It is not detection of the primordial magnetic fields, but it is just a lower bound. And in fact, very, uh, it will be very hard through the astrophysical mechanism explain the existence of the magnetic fields correlated of 10 megaparsecs, for example, with the same feeling factors. So from where the magnetic fields can come, there is a different scenarios. In fact, the magnetic field can be originated in any epochs of the early universe. And the first idea comes by Hoyle. It was even not paper. It was a conference talk, never published, uh, uh, when he said these uh, magnetic fields can be generated in the early epoch. So there is a different mechanism. It might be inflation. It might be cosmological phase transition. It might be defects, cosmological defects, topological defects, supersymmetry. But for me, it's more natural assume that the magnetic fields are generated either during inflationary epoch or the phase transition. So both these scenarios have um, advantages and disadvantages. So they, uh, I quote just the pioneering work. If, for example, you search for the magnetogenesis mechanism, you will find more than 300 different papers. So I cannot cite all of them. I just cite the pioneering work. So by inflation, uh, the magnetic field generation through the supercharge coupling to the inflaton field was described by Turner and Vidro in 88 and Baratratra in 92. And uh, in this case, the magnetic fields might have the extremely large correlation lengths. It uh, may agree well <coughs> with the lower bounds as well, can be constrained well and in agreement for the upper bounds as well. But the inflationary magnetic field generation has some difficulties because we do have the back reaction. So the magnetic field presence might spoil the inflationary stage as well. And also, sometimes we have to pay quite big price. In fact, we should assume that some kind of the symmetries have been broken. During the cosmological phase transition, the first papers appears in 91 by Tanmi Vachaspati. And this, uh, this mechanism is usually called baryogenesis-based uh, mechanism in which uh, he uh, uh, considered the cosmological first order phase transition when the phase tr uh, some transition bubbles are colliding each other. And since we have almost perfect conductor in the early universe, the magnetic fields are generated through these bubble collisions. So in this case, the magnetic field correlation length is now limited because uh, we have the causality. So correlation lens cannot be larger than the uh, hor Hubble horizon at the moment of the magnetic field generation. And actually, it is a very small. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we have quite uh, natural mechanism of the generation of the magnetic fields. Now, if somehow uh, cosmological observation will detect the magnetic fields and will be claimed that these magnetic fields are primordial origin, we can reconstruct the conditions during the early universe epoch. So, in fact, if we just measure the magnetic fields today in the galaxies, and we will know that these fields come from the amplification of the primordial seed, we can just go back and test what was the physics at the moment of the, um, of the moment of the generation. For example, at the energy scales, which will be never be reached in the lab, uh, for example, if it is inflationary generated magnetic fields, that it will be like near the Planck scales. And also, we can see the cosmological phase transition directly. So in fact, reconstruct the physical conditions in the universe when the universe was younger than one second. So what we know and what we don't know. So we measure the magnetic field in galaxies. We measure the magnetic fields in the clusters. We know its amplitude. We know the shape almost, and we know the correlation length. But we don't know where and how these magnetic fields were 
uh, generated and we don't know the, what were the initial conditions. There are the two options. One it is so-called astrophysical, another one is a cosmological. Uh, so there is a still debates and uh, there is no definitive answer and only the observation of the universe at high redshift, so in the past, can tell us what was this magnetogenesis mechanism. So here it is a numerical, three-dimensional cosmological MHD simulation by Doher et al. in 2008 when he considered different initial conditions, when the magnetic field generated through cosmology or generated through the uh, astrophysical mechanism, for example, Birman battery. So the, as you see, if you go to the high redshift, the picture will be completely different. So now I will go to the phase transition because as I mentioned, it is one of the mostly natural mechanisms to generate magnetic fields. So in fact, the physics laws are everywhere the same. It can be in the kitchen when the water is boiling or in the universe when the phase transition bulbs are uh, presented and collide each other. So here it is showing this bulb nucleation and in fact the magnetic fields can be generated on the merger of these two bubbles. So the most important quantity which we also care on, it is the magnetic helicity. In the context of the universe, it will reflect the basic parity symmetry or mirror symmetry breaking and uh, is a, there are several attempts to connect the primordial magnetic helicity with the baryogenesis and leptogenesis. And later on, I will talk also about the chiral magnetic effect. So this chiral magnetic effect originally was proposed by, in uh, AT by Willenkin, in which uh, he connects the asymmetry between left and right-handed fermions with amplification of the seed magnetic fields in the early universe. And uh, we, uh, there were, we as a paper by Boyarsky, Rucharsky, and Shaposhnikov in 2012, in which they cons applied this mechanism, chiral magnetic effect, to the early universe condition, uh, claiming that we will have the uh, possibility to generate helical magnetic fields in the early universe. And recently, um, the paper was accepted and will appear very soon in Astrophysical Journal Letters, but uh, it is available online. So we studied turbulent cascade, magnetic inverse cascade in the early universe coming from the chiral magnetic effect. So how do you describe the turbulence? It does not matter. It is in the, as I mentioned, in our home or it is the galaxies. The fundamental laws are the same everywhere. So now, as I said and promised, uh, there is a two different conditions in the universe. You might have first the generation of the magnetic field, and after the magnetic field, through the MHD processes, will generate the velocity field, or it might be vice versa. You have the bubble collisions, the bubble collisions produce the turbulence, the turbulence is kinetically dominant, and through the MHD stuff again, you are getting the generation of the magnetic fields. So here it is in 2010 papers in which we adjusted the pencil code by Axel Randerburg to describe the um, evolution of the MHD turbulence in the universe. So uh, the, on the uh, left, sorry, it's not very, very well looked here. I don't know because of the resolution. So the uh, solid lines are the magnetically dominant case. The dashed line, small one, is a generated velocity field. Here the situation is opposite. We assume that there is no magnetic field initially, but we have the, some velocity motions. And then you can see that uh, we do have a subdominant case, but in fact on the large scale, the uh, velocity field and magnetic fields gets in the in, in equipartition. 
So here it is also an interesting case, and on my knowledge it was first numerical simulations, in which we assumed that we are ejecting the magnetic field, so one K mode in the primordial plasma, and see what will be happens with the magnetic field. So you can see this one K mode here, but very soon, uh, wishing 20 turnover times, eddy turnover times, the spectrum starts to be redistributed. And we uh, see this development of this spectrum. The most interestingly, independently what kind of the initial conditions you use, you always get in K4 spectrum as the large scales, bachelor spectrum. We never can get Kazantsev, we cannot get uh, uh, white noise, never. Because this is a result of the divergence free of the magnetic fields. It can be shown mathematically that a solenoidal field, as a magnetic field it is, if it is cut it in some scales, uh, it means that the correlation length is limited, you always can have only the bachelor spectrum for the energy. And uh, the dashed lines, again, it is a kinetic velocity fields, and here it is a snapshot. So here it is a movie. I will try to play the movie. Okay, so it does not work the movie now, unfortunately, but I will skip. It will show this movie how the small correlation lens starts to be increasing during the time, and the magnetic fields energy, uh, energy is decaying. So, as I said, the magnetic fields can be generated during the inflation, but what will be happens with this magnetic field when it uh, goes through the expansion of the universe? So here it is, two cases when we assumed rotational and irrotational forcing. Again, you definitely see when it is longitudinal forcing, you are getting from the magnetic field uh, this acoustic modes, which are just um, uh, acoustic modes in the fluid, nothing else. Again, it is a snapshot. So the uh, solid lines, again, is a magnetic field. I'm sorry for the quality of the pictures. I don't know why it happens. Um, and uh, the inflation generated magnetic fields as every perturbation during inflation must have the scale invariant spectrum. So it means it is generated with the same power in all scales and the spectral shape it is K minus one. But here it is a scale of the cosmological phase transition. So when the magnetic field starts to interact inside the horizon with uh, turbulence, I mean to the fluid, inside the horizon only, because outside the horizon there is no any kind of the coupling. It generates the velocity field here. So in fact, the magnetic fields, initial magnetic fields, is a good uh, possibility to generate the vector mode, which usually is absent in the standard cosmology. So another... Um, Another possibility it is during the inflation to generate helical magnetic fields. It means that you globally, globally um, violate the parity symmetry during the early stage of the universe. In this case, um, the situation is the following. So you do not have inverse cascade. This is a very important, and uh, we have published this one in 2016. 15 or 16 in the PRL, or 17, sorry, 17 January, because usually when we are talking about the helical magnetic fields, everyone say, okay, we do have inverse cascade. In the case of inflation generated magnetic fields, you cannot have the inverse cascade because you don't have the room, more room to transfer energy on the large scales. But on the small scales, when the magnetic field starts to interact with the fluids, velocity field, you are getting amplification of the velocity fields. You see? So the magnetic field is decay on small scale, while on the large scales, it's unchanged, which is a physically very well understandable. Uh, the same it is for the um, 
redistribution of the magnetic field structure. So we know because of the conservation of the helicity, the fractional helicity is growing for the partially helical magnetic fields. In this case, this growth is a very, very slow, <coughs> almost frozen. And here it is, this PRL papers. Uh, here we show the spectra and compensate spectra. And here we do have three different cases of the turbulence. Here it is non-magnetic. It means it is just the hydro turbulence. And we have the conservation of the Luitianski integral. Here it is magnetically dominant, but helical case. And we see definitely the regular inverse cascade, which corresponds to the conversation, uh, conservation of the magnetic helicity. And in the middle, we see non-helical case, but definitely we see the, I will not call it his inverse cascade, but we called it, it inverse transfer, because you have still, not like the situation is a hydro case, this is a moving on the left. The peak is a moving. Uh, and <clears throat> the growth of the correlation lens, it is not to third scaling, but 0 0.5. And uh, the physical explanation of this one, it is some question. But uh, phenomenologically, we can say, because the magnetic field, independently what was the initial condition, always develop K4 spectrum here, the velocity field has a K2. So in some uh, very large scales, the velocity field, which was in, in equipartition in the medium scale, with the magnetic field starts to fit the magnetic field. So this inverse transfer, non-helical inverse transfer, is due to the feeding of magnetic fields by the velocity field. So this is also here in the interesting results because still we did not know the why the velocity fields develop this plateau here. There is no uh, any peak. Uh, so, and this is, was a really high resolution numerical simulation. So this is a, this another PRL paper in which we try to explain that these dashed lines, it corresponds to the velocity field and on the very large scales it starts to like feed and push the um, magnetic field peaks on the left making the mimics of the inverse transfer it, it was for the non-helical case. But situation will be completely different when we are doing the uh, magnetically field is subdominant. So the kinetic energy is dominant. So then we do not observe, observe any kind of the inverse transfer. So this inverse transfer, non-helical inverse transfer, it is just a consequence of the magnetically dominant case. The same happens if initially we have a prepartition between the magnetic field and the kinetic field. So, and the last stuff, it is this recent paper about the, the turbulent chiral magnetic cascade in the early universe. So we have here the uh, some kind of the schematic description. We get in K minus two spectrum. It is three dimensional, of course, and here it is the saturation, and here it is damping scale. So through this kind of the magnetic uh, chiral effect, you can get uh, magnetic fields, helical magnetic fields in the early universe, which will be correlated on the Hubble scales at the moment of the magnetic field generation. So here it is very briefly, some effects. First, it is the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So uh, if you have the magnetic uh, field in the early universe or turbulence in the early universe, then it will contribute to the relativistic uh, energy density, and so you can constrain the amplitude of the magnetic field or velocity field through the Big Bang nucleosynthesis bound, then no more than 10% can be added to the relativistic component. 
So another effects are based that through the Einstein equation, magnetic field generated all kind of the perturbation. So here it is the Einstein equation, here it is geometry, here it is energy momentum. So you can have three different kinds of the perturbations. Color mode, which is uh, in other sense uh, slow and fast magnetosonic waves. You can have vorticity perturbations, which is a vector mode in cosmological context and in the MHD context it is just the Alvin waves and you have the gravitational waves which does not have any analogy in the regular MHD. So you can just do the linear theory of the initial perturbation and see how the magnetic field uh, modifies the matter power spectrum. So you see this uh, additional stuff. So this gives you possibility to constrain the primordial uh, magnetic field through the large-scale structure. You can also constrain the magnetic field through the, um, through the cosmic microwave background-induced um, fluctuation, for example, vorticity constraint or Faraday rotation effect. So here it is a paper by Polar Bear and Planck in which they constrain in the primordial magnetic fields, but they completely neglected, neglected the role of the magnetic field. And here it is a puzzle, which is a, maybe something to be seen more deeply by the turbulence community. So the point is that one of the most important puzzles found by Planck collaboration in 2015, it was that uh, e-polarization which is a gradient light and curl polarization VB are different by twice, while the theory of the dust polarization in magnetosite medium predict you that it should be just equal each other. So there was a paper by Campbell, Hirata, and Kaminkowski in which they considered the magnetosite slow, fast, and Alvin waves trying to explain this one, and after the conclusion of their paper, which is here, is the same, okay, MHD turbulence fails to explain this kind of the anomalies, and might be related to the large-scale physics. But first, I guess that Lazarian recently published a paper with a student, I don't remember the name of the student, in which they said this is a very toy model description of the turbulence and much more uh, detailed turbulence description might be done. So uh, with Axel Brandenburg and my student, we are proposing to do the more realistic description of the MHD turbulence, intercluster turbulence, and see if the dust polarization can be agreed with uh, current observational stuff. Uh, second, it is... Um, uh, polarization of the cosmic microwave background, B mode of the polarization, as I said, if you have the magnetic field, you get the vorticity. If you get the vorticity, then you will have B uh, mode of the polarization. And also, if the magnetic field by some chance is helical, then you will have parity or cross correlation in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And also the another effect, it is the Faraday rotation. So in 2008, W uh, map collaboration considered the constraint, but they forgotten about the magnetic field just considering the Lorentz symmetry violation. Because in the case of the Lorentz symmetry violation, you also have the CMB birefringence. Birefringence, it is completely the same as the Faraday rotation, but uh, it is not the same way frequency dependent. So recently, the Polar Bear and Planck published the paper to constraining the, not only the Lorentz symmetry violation, but the magnetic field accounting for the limit of the rotation angle measurements. I mean measurements, not measurements, I mean the upper bounds. But again, this kind of the stuff was completely neglecting that before uh, cosmic microwave background fluctuations formed, and today the magnetic field has been evolved. It is not like stay frozen, it decays, it interacts with the fluids and so on. So uh, what we 
are proposing, we are proposing to reconsider Planck stuff and do the, uh, and do the um, computation of the CMB fluctuations accounting for the magnetic field uh, evolution. Here it is the most important, so everyone is excited that we detected the gravitational waves, predicted 100 years ago, but the fact that one of the possible signals of the gravitational waves might be the turbulence. And uh, it might be as well the hydro or magnetoside. So again, the pioneering work, it is by Kaminkowski, Kosowski, Turner in 94, and they consider the bubble collisions, follow up turbulence, and if the turbulence is there, due to the symmetry breaking, you are generating the gravitational wave signals. So here it is a story which is, uh, was uh, like amazing one. I have a collaborator, Grigol Gogoberidze, Giga Gogoberidze, he is working on the turbulence in aeroacoustic turbulence, and he worked on the sound wave generation through the turbulence, and uh, so on, and he told me, oh, you are working on the gravitational wave generation. Why we don't just use a very well known light hill aeroacoustic approximation and compute the gravitational waves through the same formulas as it was done previously? So we have done, and here, unfortunately, I don't know what happens with the PPF files, but here you can see the small dashed lines, it is for Mach 101, and solid lines, it is done through the aeroacoustic approximation by Light Hill 72. And uh, the strong numerical simulation does not show, in fact, any difference. Only for the Mach 1, uh, number one, which is unrealistic, for the universe turbulence. So after this, we said, uh, why should we just do so hard uh, computation um, while this formalism is already ready and it is completely analytical? So we have done uh, using this formalism to computing what will be the, not the, only the signal of the gravitational wave and shown that this signal will be most probably detectable by laser interferometer space antenna, and Lisa included this one in the white paper, and it is the one, so it is a possibility to detect the gravitational wave from phase transition, and if you detect from phase transition, you can be also know something new about the phase transition and conditions there. And we also computed what will be the polarization degree of such gravitational waves. But here it is, uh, Story. Uh, everything is fine here, but aeroacoustic approximation by light hill gives you possibility to consider the short duration of the turbulence. But in reality, the turbulence does not stop after the phase transition ends. It decays and comes even on the slower amplitude, but come, maybe come today. So here it is the gravitational wave equation. These terms in all previous study has been neglecting. So it was neglected, the universe is expanding because it was said, okay, the turbulence duration is short comparable to the history of the universe time. So now we decided to do the new model in the pencil code and maybe you know that pencil code was just written for the turbulence in the sun magnetosphere not for the context of the universe. But now we do have the model, gravitational model. So this uh, working progress. So uh, Axel, with Axel, Arthur, and uh, two students at Colorado at Carnegie Mellon. And here I come to my conclusion. The universe is a perfect conductor. Uh, so it is... Uh, um, Amazing that you can apply all the turbulence laws uh, to the universe and describe the early stage of the universe expansion. Uh, that uh, turbulence experience uh, decay during the expansion of the universe. So when you are computing what will be the predicted magnetic fields coming from the early universe or what will be the velocity field coming from this universe or what will be the correlation lens, you should definitely account for the, 
for the evolution of the and decay of the turbulence. Uh, in fact, the presence of the primordial magnetohydrodynamic turbulence will be a very good plausible explanation for the observ observed magnetic fields in galaxies and clusters and also maybe in voids if confirmed. And uh, this primordial turbulence has different signatures which can be tested through current observation. And finally, I would like to thank the conference organizers. I would like to thank also the associate program, ICTP, high energy cosmology section, and my collaborators, which are here, Alexey Boyarsky, Axel Brandenburg, they are in the alphabetic order, Leonardo Campanelli, Ruth Durer, Georg Fronich, Grigol Guberidze, Artur Kosovsky, Nathan Klorin, Leonard Kisslinger, Barat Ratra, Igor Ogachevsky, Alek Rucharsky, Jennifer Schrober, Trevor Stevens, Alexander Tevzadze, and Tami Vachaspati. And also I would like to thank the three students which are involved in these projects. Thank you.